You are listening to the Terroir Podcast on Paris Underground Radio. For more great content, please join us on Patreon. Did you know, Emily, that there is wine in this world that is $43,000 a bottle? And can you guess where it comes from? Holy shit. (laughs) Well, (laughs) I know very little about pricing and luxury when it comes to wine, but I'm going to guess that it comes from Burgundy. It couldn't come from anywhere else. That is it. We are in Burgundy for the next two episodes. This is the Terroir Podcast, where we talk about food and wine in France. I am Caroline Connor, otherwise known as Wine Dine Caroline. I run Lyon Wine Tastings in Lyon, the culinary capital of France, where I teach about wine, and I also host wine retreats. Amazing. And her wine retreats are fantastic. You should definitely go drink and eat in Lyon. I'm Emily Monaco. I am not in Lyon. I'm in Paris, where I work as a culinary journalist and a culinary tour guide. And I'm a big old food nerd. um, And I'm super excited to be learning a bit more about this super, super fancy wine region from you, Caroline, and delving into some of the cheeses and dishes and all kinds of other things, many of which are associated with Burgundy but turns out are not actually as linked to Burgundy as you might think. So we're going to do a deep dive here into, I think, one of the fanciest regions in France. Yeah. I mean, this is definitely a wine pilgrimage place. Like people are obsessed with Burgundy for a lot of reasons. So Burgundy is a big one. I know we like our Bordeaux episode. We're like, let's talk about Bordeaux in one episode. It's a little bit like that. We have two episodes for Burgundy, but we're going to cover most of the wine today. I'm going to do a really high level overview. Um, we're not going to go into too much specific because ain't nobody got time for that. <laughs> so let's just get started. So Burgundy is a region of France. And remember, if France is a square, which it's not, it would be like on the right side, kind of in the middle towards the top. So it runs from the city of Dijon down to the city of Macon, um, mostly like, all on the sort of left bank of the Saone River. And it's this vertical edge of a valley, basically. And that terroir is is really important because it actually used to be, you know, the edge of an ancient sea. And so we have these sort of strata that you find because, you know, there were all these sea deposits. There's a lot of limestone and clay. There's a lot of different soil types here, which, which we're going to go into more. In terms of the wine, it is for all intents and purposes, Pinot Noir and Chardonnay. The reds are Pinot Noir, the whites are Chardonnay. Now, you know, people are going to be like, yeah, actually, there is a little bit of Gamay here. There is a little bit of, I think, Pinot Gris here. There is a little bit of Sauvignon Blanc randomly, um, but you're never going to see that. What you might see at like a hipster natural wine bar would be a grape called Aligote, which we will also talk a little bit more about. But for the most part, we're talking Pinot Noir and Chardonnay. And they're not generally blending grapes here. It is Pinot Noir and then Chardonnay for the whites. Pinot, pure Pinot on the reds, pure Chardonnay on the whites. We also then have different classification systems. So here we do find Grand Cru's and Premier Cru's. We talked about those a little bit in our Bordeaux episode, but it's organized a little differently here. Whereas the Cru system in Bordeaux is attached to your, you know, estate, not your estate, your, um, your domain, like your brand, right? Here, it really is about the vineyard. So many different domains can be in the same vineyard and, you know, maybe have two rows of a Grand Cru vineyard to make, you know, one barrel of wine. And so Grand Cru is the top, then there's Premier Cru, it's not a lot of that. And then we have the sort of greater labeling system. Do you know about how these wines are labeled, Emily? So I don't, and I'm actually really excited to learn more about this because I think, especially, you know, catering my tours to Americans, and I'm not doing wine tours, I'm doing food tours that have wine. So a lot of the people who come on my tours don't know a lot about wine. They might know what they like to drink back home. And they say things like, oh, you know, I drink a lot of Pinot Noir. And it's like, okay, great, that's Burgundy, except that, I mean, there's so much variety in Burgundy. And I, I mean, I've seen the maps, I know the vague names, but I think this is one of those appellations where you have like a big appellation, like a big AOP, and then within it, I don't even know how many little AOP, I know we talked about this with Bordeaux, that you have lots of little AOPs and AOCs within the big AOP. Is that kind of what we're looking at here? Exactly. So Burgundy is the quintessential Russian nesting doll. and there are a lot of teeny tiny, I mean, and the difference between here and, and Bordeaux is very much scale. Burgundy is tiny. It's teeny tiny. There is not a lot of it. There's just not a lot of land, vineyard area, and there's not a lot of wine made there. But the Russian nesting doll is very nesty. And the big doll is Bulgogne Burgundy. 
Then we have the Cote d'Or. So Cote d'Or is, Cote means slope. So we really are talking about this sort of ridge of sloped vineyards. The Cote d'Or comprises of the Cote de Nuit, which is the northernmost Cote, and the Cote de Bonne. Those are where our most expensive and fancy wines come from. So when we talk about the most, you know, the $43,000 Burgundy, which is a Le Roi Musigny Grand Cru Cote de Nuit. <laughs> it's just too much money. That mm-hmm. is in the Cote de Bonne. So, or sorry, the Cote de, the Cote de Nuit. So basically, Cote de Nuit is famous for the reds. There isn't white up there. It's all red. And this is where we have really famous vineyards like Musigny, um, Chambon Musigny, Von Romani, Romani, uh, Romani Conti Latache, like Domaine Romani Conti, which is really the most famous, probably cult, super expensive Burgundy. They're up there. Then down in the Cote de Bonne, which is just a little further south. And we have the, the town of Nuit Saint-Georges in Cote de Nuit, which is lovely. And then in Cote de Bonne, you have the town of Bonne, which is really the big town in Burgundy proper. Have you been there? It's a nice place. I have been there. Yeah. And I think this is really helpful to me already because just the Cote de Nuit and the Cote de Bone, both expensive, both in the Cote d'Or, which means gold. So I'm like, got it. The the gold one is the expensive one. The gold one is the expensive one. I mean, they're all expensive, but Cote de Bone, no, I mean, the the Cote d'Or is really where it's at. So Cote de Bone is is seen as being a lighter style than Cote de Nuit. So if we had a Cote de Nuit and a Cote de Bonne in front of us right now on the Pinots, the Cote de Nuit should be richer and more intense and the Cote de Bonne would be lighter. And Pinot Noir is, you know, a light red grape. It doesn't tend to be super tannic. And that is one of the reasons why it's really highly prized. It's really perfumed and wonderful, but the Cote de Bones are lighter. And the Cote de Bonne um, village appellations that are really famous are like Volnay and Pomard. But then we also have some really incredible whites here. We have Merceau, which is very famous. That's going to be quite generally quite an oaky style, um, rich Chardonnay. And then we have um, Chassin Morachet and Pouligny Morachet. And those are also very, very high end. Those three are the white, the white, you know, village level AOCs that are very important. And so within each of these village level AOCs, and, and I only listed a couple of them, and there's many of them, then there also are single vineyard defined areas. And um, we're going to talk a little bit about more about those. But that is where you would find, you know, a premier or a grand cru would be assigned to a specific vineyard. So south of the Cote d'Or, which, you know, is this golden slope and it's really this vertical strip. You can see it on Google Maps really clearly. We have the Cote Chalonnaise and that is a little more open and spread out. The vineyard's a little more, um, you know, spread around. And this is sort of hilly. It's really beautiful here, but it's not that like one strip of land. It definitely opens up here and becomes hillier. And that is where you're going to find really good value. So if you're a normal person and you don't have thousands of uh, dollars to drop on a bottle, you can go to the Cote Chalonnaise where you can find wines from appellations like Mercury. Givry is really nice. That's that's one of my favorites. Montagny make really exceptional whites. And uh, Rully, so R-U-L-L-Y, they're also very good. So I really like the Cote Chalonnaise. Um, is that, uh, you know, are those wines that you're familiar with, Emily? So no. I already feel like I'm learning a ton. So you're taught you in this Cote Chardonnay, then we still have both the the whites and the reds. Is that right? And are these still going to be like the really oaky whites? They're going to be less oaky than Merceau and the and the Morachés, I would say. And they're not they're not as expensive, and they're not you know so they're probably not going to be aged as long. But they are still really good. I particularly quite like Montaigne for the whites and Givry for the reds. Okay, really good. And are these still going to be ones that you can like? buy now and age and like they'll get better with time like is that kind of the the point here or are these like ones you're going to want to buy and like drink now that's a, a really good question you know the problem is that nobody does keep their wine anymore so in the past merchants might keep wine and then sell it when it was ready but nobody's doing that and so winemakers are making wines that can be drunk now so i wouldn't stress too much if you don't have a seller you know even I was, I was with a winemaker in Cote Roti a couple weeks ago and was talking to him and he's like, nobody is holding on to it for tw- 10, 20 years. And so I have to make it in a style that's, that's better to drink now. And the struggle is to actually find that middle ground where it can age, but it, it is also approachable in its youth. So I wouldn't worry too much about that, but I do think it benefits from some, some time, you know, especially white burgundy, white burgundy, the really high end white burgundies from Merceau and the, and the Mojaches. They need time because they just, they're just really tight and like asleep for the first few years of their life. Ooh. I actually did have a um, 2018 Chassin Montrachet last night at, at Paul Bocuse, which was amazing. 
and it was really good. And, you know, and I was talking to Sam and I was like, you know, once when it's good now, he's like, no, we just tasted it. It's really good now. So it is interesting to see that people are cracking that code to figure out how to make them a little more approachable in their youth. I love how you just drop that. Like, oh, you know, last night when I was at Paul Bacuse, no big deal. Oh my God. It was insane. Caroline's such a big deal. It was so, it was so fucking expensive. It was, I've never been there because I've never had anyone who was willing to spend that much money with me on food. It was, it was 450 euros per person. I mean, worth it, right? It was awesome. It was amazing. I loved it. I would totally go back there in a year or two um, <laughs> or with someone who will pay for me. Uh, where is he, by the way? Where is my husband who will take me to nice restaurants? Excuse me. If you are out there listening, call me. What? But I think that it's a really interesting like indication of like kind of one of the topics that we're talking about today, which is like things are expensive. Things are luxurious. Are they worth it? And to me, I feel like Paul Bocuse would be worth it, right? It was worth it to me, but it did occur to me that, you know, I spent as much on a meal as some people spend on rent in this city for a month. Fair enough. So obviously I'm, I'm, you know, coming from a place of extreme privilege, but it was fucking incredible. Yeah. I loved it. I mean, it was a, it was a wonderful experience. Two star Michelin, really incredible place. Amazing. I really, yeah, I did enjoy it. Uh, okay. Back to Burgundy. So Macon is the last of the sort of bigger regions within the region. So we have the big doll, which is Bourgogne. And then we have a smaller dolls, the smaller doll, which is Côte de Nuit, Côte de Bonne, Côte Chalonnais, and then the Maconnais. So Maconnais is going to be predominantly white. No, it's really just going to be Chardonnay. And um, they tend to be unoaked for the most part. Um, there's a lot of like Macon dash village name. And then there's a lot of Cremant there too. A lot of Cremant and Côte Chalonnais as well, uh, which I know we've, we've talked about a lot. That is sort of the non-champagne bubbles you find all over France. But Macon does have a couple really exceptional appellations as well. I really like Viré Classé. And then Puy Fousse. Puy Fousse actually just got Premier Cru uh, status for some of its vineyards, which was, you know, a 15 year art, like fight to get that status. So getting recognition takes a really long time and it's really difficult, but it, it definitely allows them to charge a lot more. So Puy Fousse is incredible, not to be confused with Puy Fumé, which is um, Sauvignon Blanc from the Loire, but I'm sure we'll talk about that in a different episode. Yeah, that's a really good point. Like, I feel like for a long time before I really had any wine knowledge, I would see those two and be like, they're about the same because the name looks the same, but they taste completely different. They fr come from completely different areas. But I love Puy Fusé. And should I be worried now that it's going to get more expensive now that it's been classified? Definitely. Excellent. Wonderful. It was still classified, but now it, it has Premier Cru Vineyards. Okay. Yeah. Which does give the whole area more uh, prestige. And and once we're down here, like Puy Fusse is really at the, at the far south of Macon, um, sorry, the Maconnet of Burgundy. It's got this beautiful like stone outcrop called the Roche Solutre that's really amazing. It's a really beautiful place. It's very, very close to the top of Beaujolais. So there's actually a little bit of overlap there. Saint-Verin is, is also a white Burgundy from the Maconnet that, that like overlaps with the top of Beaujolais. And those tend to be yeah, inexpensive, uh, unoaked Chardonnays, but they're not, they're not in the Chablis style, which is really crisp and minerally. They, they are, you know, using usually neutral oak, but we're not going to talk about Chablis today because. Damn, Chablis is one of my faves. Okay. When are we going to talk about Chablis? Well, let's talk about it in the next episode because obviously Excellent. it is, it is technically, technically being like administratively and, and historically even, you know, it's considered Burgundy. But honestly, I don't uh, think of it as Burgundy because it is nowhere near Burgundy and it has completely different terroir. And so we'll talk about that next week. We'll, we'll talk about Chablis. I love Chablis too, but okay. it just doesn't fit in with, with this particular uh, part of the world, <laughs> honestly. Like, but I'm glad to see it separated, honestly, because I feel like Burgundy can get super overwhelming and, you, you know, to keep things that are together you know, with the same, with the same terroir, we, we have, we divide France so many different ways. We divide it, you know, politically and we divide it departmentally and, and administratively, but like we're at the terroir podcast. So, I mean, I think if it doesn't have the same terroir, it totally makes sense to keep it separate. And I'm excited to talk about it next week because it also pairs quite nicely with some of the cheeses from this region. Oh yes, it does. Need to know what's going on in Paris this week? Make sure to check out Don't Miss This on Paris Underground Radio. You'll learn about events, museums, restaurants, all the cool shit that's happening in Paris this week. And we will be right back with a word from our sponsors. And now back to the Terroir Podcast. But before we go too far into that, I do have a question. 
which is, okay, so Burgundy obviously has been making wine for a really long time, but why? Like how? I mean, I think we've talked a little bit about the fact that we have a long, long um, history of winemaking in France in general, but when does wine sort of get its start in Burgundy specifically? Well, you know, the reason why these wines are so prestigious and they're so fucking expensive is is because they're, they've been fancy for, you know, a thousand years. So brief history of Burgundy. The Romans. It's always the fucking Romans. Isn't yeah. it? The Gauls, who were the sort of native, you know, Celtic tribes here in France, were trading with the Romans in Italy and they were drinking wine. So as far back as the second or the first century BC, we actually have some um, archaeological evidence in Burgundy of of Roman amphora suggesting trade and a taste for wine, which is interesting. But the Romans, they watered down their wine and only the gods were allowed to drink it straight up. And the Gauls, the the French, they they were considered barbaric for drinking it uh, neat. <laughs> so <laughs> they were onto something. Barbaric or godly? I know, right? <laughs> I just love, I, I want a sexy Gallic barbarian. Where is he? They're all like, dead. I told you. Napoleon uh, III pretended they were still alive, but they're all dead. The Romans killed them all. That's no, the problem. Oh, I want a Gallic barbarian to take me to fancy restaurants. Well, then go to Denmark. Okay, that sounds good. I, I feel like a Danish, <laughs> guy, a Danish guy would take me to nice restaurants and be very tall. I was going to say, he'll be taller than you. Caroline's tall. I'm tall. That's a problem here. She's tall and blonde. Come on, Danish men. Come, come take Caroline yeah. to Paul Bocuse. French people don't like... I think they do like big women, but they are so brainwashed against like fatness that they, they have a lot of hangups about it, which is unfortunate. Okay. So not, not about me and my date and my lack of a dating life. It's all connected. It's if all If you linked. like big blonde women and you want to take me out to dinner, I will not say no. Okay. So. And now back to the podcast. And now back to the podcast. <laughs> So in 52 BC, the Romans invaded Gaul and they built the town of Utun in Burgundy. Burgundy is first mentioned for a quality wine production as early as the 4th century in a speech dedicated to the Emperor Constantine Augustus in 312. 312. It's a long time ago. That is a very long time ago. Yeah, it's a long so time ago. So people have been like, what do they say? What are the kids saying these days? They're like uh, stands for Burgundy. No, I think that's even I'm older. Like, I'm just very old. Yeah, I'm just old. Not, we, so let's not try to play. Let's not try. So, Bur- so Burgundian terroir has been important and and exciting since 312. Yeah, it's pretty amazing. Cool. Yeah. Then the Roman Empire, um, you know, does its collapsing thing, and Bummer. what rises in its place is monks. Monks. So many monks. So many monks. So Christianity takes over as the kind of organizing principle of uh, you know basically this whole fucking Europe, right? And wine, uh, remember, in Christianity is sacred. It's the blood of Christ. So that definitely gives it a leg up. So basically, no, the nobility are gifting these huge estates to the church. And in 1098, the Cistercians set up a cito. Cito? Is that how I would say that? Cito. That is how you'd say it, cito, which I only know because they do also make a fantastic cheese, which, since it's a monk cheese, is obviously super stinky and aromatic. And, you know, like, like most monastic cheeses, but the Cistercians have this like Zen and the art of like doing something boring while they pray. And so they were like, cheese, they were washing the outside of this cheese at Cito. So that's how I know how you say Cito because of a stinky cheese. That's funny because last week uh, you were talking about how they flip cheeses too in champagne. They're just, they're just cheese, cheese flippers. See, Zen and the art of boring cheese shit. I love it. Yeah. So the Cistercians basically get these big bits of land in, in 1098. So like, you know, turn of the century, uh, no millennium in, in the Cote de Bonne and the Cote de Nuit, as well as Chalonnais and, and Chablis. Um, again, we'll talk about Chablis next week. And uh, yeah, you're definitely going to talk about some of that cheese. And then we oh, yeah. also have the Cluniac order at Cluny, and that's more Macon and Cote Chalonnais um, and a little bit further north. But what, What's cool about this is that the monks, and I think this is probably similar with cheese, they really developed the techniques and technology and and knowledge of winemaking. You know, they were scientists. And because it was kind of chaotic time in Europe, politically, the, the abbeys were actually pretty chill and left alone to an extent. And so they were able to pass down written knowledge and real hands-on knowledge from generation to generation in a way that nobody else was really able to do. And so you do see this throughout France and and throughout Europe that the monastic tradition 
is what allowed us to learn how to make better wine and, and then keep that knowledge and expand on it every, you know, all the time. It's pretty cool. Yeah. Like you're built, I mean, that, that whole idea of, you know, literacy, I mean, we take it for granted these days, but if, you know, the monks are the ones who can write, they can make written records of things. But also if you're constantly having new monks coming in, like you said, like they're going to pass down the traditions, both like in a hands-on kind of way and in a written way. So, I mean, it's, it, it makes sense to me that that's where we're going to be, be seeing not only maintaining a tradition, but also improving upon the quality year after year after year. Exactly. Exactly. And so, you know, by the 15th century, these wines were renowned across Europe and the, uh, you know, the monks really understood terroir. And so they were the ones who actually established what we still refer to today, the clima. So clima are, are vineyard plots that are defined by their soil type and, you know, microclimate. And so when you look at a map of Burgundy, it's all these different little parcels that are named. That was the monks who were doing that. And then we also see a word called clo, C-L-O-S, and that is actually a walled clima. And so that's a tradition out there. And you see that a lot. It's really pretty, the walled clima. And that was like to protect it from boars and shit like that. But clo are really beautiful. You'll see, um, you know, these little walled vineyards. And then, yeah, the climas are this idea of, I mean, the really the people who, who figured out terroir are these monks who were like, why does my pinot taste different from this parcel than this parcel you know and it's because okay we have we have more limestone here okay over here we have more clay okay over here you know and they started to really figure that out and measure it and define it so it's pretty cool I mean it really goes back a long way that's super cool and it also just kind of reminds me of like we all need to this is like a, a higher level thing but in like giving themselves like time for what's the word to, to get really close to to the land and to spend all this time doing just one thing they really started asking themselves questions about it and figuring out, you know, I mean, it, it's not, it's scientific, but it's also just like observation. And I think that's really cool and something we maybe don't take enough time for these days. So I'm, I'm a big fan of these monks. Yeah, they were, they were uh, making really good shit. And the Dukes of Burgundy were very interested in this stuff. I mean, it was liquid gold, you know, from, from the 14th century on Europe is, you know, kind of becoming more, I guess, stable, right? Is, is that right? Maybe not stable, but it's very, everything's very political and there's a lot of players. Yeah. And I think there's a lot of, we're moving away a little bit from like the feudal system that kind of defined the middle ages and moving into like bigger clusters of like. Yeah. Consolidated, not stable. <laughs> yeah. Consolidated is probably more, but yeah, no, I agree with you. But I'm, so the Dukes of Burgundy, obviously we're talking about like kind of consolidation. Dukes of Burgundy have been in power like until, since like the ninth century but then it's burgundy is annexed by france in the 15th century and so like that's sort of when we start to see because they're part of france like we start to see kind of the power that they have over this section of france and they do have a ton of power right they're a little they're a little controlling they have a lot of power and but they are also the people that really create the first ever wine related policy in history. So 1395, Philip the Bold bans Gamay. So I talked about this in our, in our you know, Leon episode where I talk about Beaujolais. They banned Gamay. It was like right after the plague, everyone died. And so there was a lot of Gamay. Gamay is just really easy to grow and it makes a lot of juice. But ultimately, you know, he was like, this isn't good enough. We need to stick with Pinot and Pinot is notoriously annoying. And, but yeah, I mean, it really, it really actually screwed the industry for a good 30 years. And like the mayor of bone was like, you can't do this. And he was like, I can do whatever the fuck I want. But ultimately it was, it was, you know, a move that did maintain the quality and status of Burgundy. So these guys were politicians and they served their wines at events all throughout Northern Europe, you know, Belgium and Paris, you know, they were, they were at court. And so they were bringing these wines to the court. And so it really was wine of the rich and powerful, even as far back as, you know, 500 years ago which is pretty crazy. The French court, obviously, is its is its thing. So it, it you know, has an incredible amount of power coming into 17th century when the church is also starting to kind of wane at this point and um, is selling off its plots to the bourgeois, which is interesting, and the nobility. So the nobility are, all, are still uh, kicking around at this point, but the bourgeois are also gaining in power. And these are, you know, non-noble merchants, basically, right? Yeah. So like following the French Revolution there, you're allowed to have power if you have money and no title, basically. And so they're well, like, well, I have that. So this is before that even. Oh. They were still well, we people go. who were there were still people who were gaining an influence before 
the revolution in, in this part of France. At the start of the 17th century, I like this, Champagne is more successful. And, you know, we talked about how Champagne and Burgundy were always kind of vying for the court attention in our, in our last episodes on Champagne, because Champagne's a lot closer to Paris. It's a lot, you know, it makes sense that that's what they're going to drink. But it really had a big leg up in the court because King Louis XIV, physician Fagin, who was from Burgundy, advised the king to drink Burgundy for his health. And then everyone else obviously had to drink it too. So it had a little moment there, um, which I thought is kind of funny. It really, the structure is fun. Like, you know, up until this, you know, at this point, we're talking, you know, 18th century, 17th, 18th century, and even, you know, further back, it, the kind of market was structured as these like courtiers, you know, court people who would be who would basically like be your tour guide and like welcome you and like help you choose which one you wanted if you went to visit and then there were the um commissionaire who would buy wine on the behalf of their customers so they're more like agents in the 18th century we see negociant which we have talked about before these are people who buy wine from growers and then like age it or and bottle it and sell it uh and we see them really emerge the uk is a really big market even back then the enlightenment we we see people really wanting to f- more deeply understand wine making and terroir and we also see the first time that people are sort of codifying tasting vocabulary. So that's pretty interesting. Yeah, the Enlightenment's like a really interesting time just to sort of see, like for codifying things in general. I mean, uh, during our Champagne episode, we were talking about Diderot and his encyclopedia. And like, they're basically trying to define everything and to codify everything. Um, and it's a little bit obsessive. It, I think it still lingers a little bit in France. We do like codifying stuff and like defining stuff, but like, Obviously, it has some payoff because, you know, now we have, you say, this first codified tasting vocabulary. Yeah, I mean, people start to kind of, yeah, I mean, I guess have, have more consistency in the way they analyze wine. Uh, glass bottle technology, which we talked about with champagne, also helped to allow the wines to be aged longer. And then older wines became, you know, became more of a commodity, more valuable. In uh, 1787, Thomas Jefferson visited Burgundy when he was living in France and bought a bunch for the White House. <laughs> yeah, and he that's not the only thing he brought to the White House. So he was like a little bit obsessed with Europe, and he he brought back all sorts of things. He went to Italy and discovered pasta. He brought back macaroni back. You told this story. <laughs> but hang on. He brought There's mac another- and cheese. He did bring mac and cheese. but it, So I think it's important also to know that it – We say Jefferson because Jefferson is the name that we know, but the name that we don't know and we should know is James Hemings. So James Hemings was the chef to Thomas Jefferson. He was born in the 18th century. He was enslaved, but he was the first American to train as a chef in France. And so he was black American, was able to train as a chef in France and brought a lot of the sort of recipes that he discovered back to Virginia at the behest of Thomas Jefferson as someone enslaved by Thomas Jefferson. But we really have- That's amazing. We really do have James Hemings to thank for um, for a lot of the sort of European exports to America at, the, at this early point in the American adventure story disaster. That is so interesting. And so, I mean, of course, Thomas Jefferson wasn't fucking making pasta, right? That's right. super cool. It's uh, and I I hope that those stories. I mean, I feel like those stories are becoming more available, you know, and and widely told. So thank you, Emily, for that. Definitely, yeah. But obviously, you know, Thomas Jefferson is bringing stuff back to the back to the states or what the the colonies, I guess. At, well, are we the states? We're co- we're the federate. We're something. My knowledge of French to, history is a lot better than my knowledge of America. Trying to think back to Hamilton. Yeah, oh, yeah. Hamilton. <laughs> The greatest. Yeah, Jefferson is definitely an asshole in Hamilton. I feel like he's an asshole in general. I, maybe yes. Yeah, it's funny. I mean, I I, I trust Lin Manuel uh, Lin Manuel Miranda. So me too. <laughs> I'm sure he he got it right. <laughs> I met him once at a party in. Oh my god, are you in, kidding San, me? In San Sebastian before he was famous, like he was like, oh yeah, I'm this like you know musical theater nerd, and we got drunk. Uh, he was there with his wife, and I am forever angry that I didn't get a picture with him that night because another friend of mine did, and it's like he was just being cool. Oh my god, I'm so lunch. jealous. I'm obsessed yeah. with him. I'm obsessed. If you're enjoying this episode of the Terroir Podcast, you may also be interested in our sister podcast, The Heart of You, where expert Annette Deleu teaches you how to get in touch with your innermost manifestations and desires. The Terroir Podcast will be right back after a word from our sponsors. And now back to the Terroir Podcast. So post-revolution. Property is confiscated, right, by the government, broken up. The property of the church and the aristocracy, which is what everything was in Burgundy, is confiscated, broken up, and then it's bought by these bourgeois families who already, you know, had some influence and some money. They're like, fuck yeah. And 
Can you talk a little bit about the reason why it's all broken up in these like fucked up inheritance laws? Okay. Well, I mean, like Napoleonic Code is all kinds of crazy laws. So the Napoleonic Code does a lot of cool things. One of the things that it does is that it actually makes, unlike in a lot of the rest of Europe, homosexuality is no longer illegal in France, which means that the fact that there were French deportee, French gay deportees who were deported for being gay in France is very mixed up legislation and, and very cunning sort of collaborationist nonsense that we're only really grappling with today. But I digress. Napoleon also, as part of the Napoleonic law, fixed these very egalitarian inheritance laws that meant that you're not allowed to disinherit your children. So that's why often, like if you have like a family home in somewhere amazing and beautiful and rural, you actually own like one sixty fourth of it with all of your cousins and second cousins. And, you know, and you can't you basically have to if one person wants out, all the other cousins have to agree to buy that person out. And that's part of the reason why you have all this big, empty property out in the countryside that no one can sell because there's like one like dissenting cousin who's like, I don't want to sell the family heritage. And all the other 63 are like, we do. And he's like, well, fuck you. And so they can't. Yeah, they need they this. This rule is really bad for for farmers and for wineries, because basically it meant that um, these properties just got divided up, divided up, divided up by, you know, because you can't disinherit, you know, like like if. Because you can't disinherit. Let's say I have three kids. Only one of them wants to make wine. The other two basically have to sell to that one. And there's all these taxes involved with with the sales. So like everyone loses, basically. Everyone loses. It, it wasn't, it's not good for, I don't think it's good. I think it's bullshit, honestly. Um, and I, I, it shocks me that it still exists to this day. But it, it really, it means that family, I mean, I guess the point of it is that family wealth cannot be maintained, which is the point, right? It Well, family wealth cannot be maintained, but also- it means that like you can't like you can't say fuck you to one of your kids, but people still do it because they do it by giving gifts when they're still alive. So like they'll they'll dissolve their own wealth in favor of the child who they want to inherit. And then by the time that they die, the kids they didn't like are inheriting like a third of a ramshackle house. And the other one who I mean, it's, it's just it's just kind of it, it it's a it has a, it's a good idea in theory to protect from preferential treatment but what actually ends up happening is that people get screwed i just like don't know why do we care about like weird brother fred who sucks like let him not have like i I don't know (laughs) i think it's dumb but it um it also definitely yeah means that there's all these empty properties and and it means that you have to be insanely wealthy in order to have any kind of size of land in here and nobody does like everyone's parcels are fucking tiny here but Napoleon did love Burgundy. He only drank Chambertin, which is funny. He was not a foodie, though, was he? No, Napoleon had weird tastes. And, like, I think there's a lot to be said for the fact that, like, he was widely disliked during his lifetime, which, I mean, understandable. He tried to invade Russia in January. And then when the soldiers, all of his soldiers, many of his soldiers, hundreds of thousands of his soldiers died of hypothermia, he refused to pay the families of anyone who didn't die in combat. So, like, unpopular decisions. But like people used to make fun of him because he would water his wine. But so many people were watering their wine at that point. And he also, but he did have like the taste of a small child. Like he pretty much only ate chicken and lentils and he hated when things touched on his plate. So, and he used to forget to eat all the time. How, well, maybe that's why he needed to water down his wine. Probably. All of his friends used to say though, and this is his friends, not the people who hated him, that were like, they were like, if you get invited to Napoleon's house for dinner, make sure you eat first. (laughs) No one would ever say that about me. No, they would not. You have a very well-stocked, beautiful kitchen. Yeah. When you come to my house, you're going to eat well. So Burgundy was popular with uh, the rich outside of France as well. It was very popular as far, very popular in the Russian court and in America, you know, as, as we said about Thomas Jefferson. And then the classifications that we already had based on the clima, you know, started to be further sort of organized into a hierarchy by someone called Laval in the mid 1800s. And then we get phylloxera, which ruins everything. But phylloxera, again, is this great pandemic that swept throughout uh, the world at the end of the 1800s. It did provide an opportunity for replanting. And it provided an opportunity for replanting based on some of the principles that, you know, had been kind of figured out in the 1700s and 1800s about, you know, how you could kind of optimize a vineyard area. You know, before there were sort of vines here and there. When, when you know, now we see vineyards, they're all in these perfect rows. It didn't used to look like that. That was a really post-phylloxera thing that allowed for basically 
horses to plow in between the the rows. Now, obviously, we have more tractors and things like that. But um, vineyards did not used to look like that. And then, you know, the 20th century, we talked a lot about uh, about World War One and World War Two in uh, previous previous episodes. But yeah, World War One sucks. It's horrible. Everybody dies and nothing is good. The AOC system uh, starts in 1935. So that's new. World War II was also not great. And um, <laughs> and, the, and it was a series of really bad vintages too until 1945, which was a legendary vintage. And then really, you know, in the second half of the 20th century, the prices just go, go really nuts. So prices really get out of hand. I mean, prices of wine, of Burgundy to, or Bordeaux and Champagne, everything is starting to go insane. But the difference between Burgundy and Champagne and Burgundy and Bordeaux is again that Burgundy's fucking tiny. Like that cannot be overstated. There just is not a lot of wine here. It's not. It's it's so small. It's so small compared to to Bordeaux. It's just tiny. There's not a lot here, and so the prices. These wines are rare, and like older vintages are rare, and the you know the finest ones are, are super super rare. And so there's a huge scandal, uh, basically in the early 2000s about fake wine and wine fraud. I love this story and I'm surprised that you don't know it, Emily, but it's one that no, I No, I've never heard this, but I'm I'm psyched to learn more about it. I love me a scandal. It's well, I love a heist and Ooh. and a scammer. So, ba- and I have a personal connection to this story, so it's uh it's pretty wild, but many people have heard of this because they've seen the documentary Sour Grapes, which I highly recommend. But let's remember, let's go back to 2000. Everybody is swimming in money, right? There is a lot of money. This is before the financial crisis. This is Wolf of Wall Street moment where all these douchebags are like, can you know, inside trading and just getting rich and rich and rich. The wine scene is the same. So there's a big auction market. It's really important. People are loving, you know, older wines from the 80s and, and beyond uh, and back in the day. And rich people are interested in having huge wine sellers to show off their wealth. And, um, you know, like Bill Koch, Koch, one of the fucking Koch brothers, he had one of the world's best sellers, um, you know, just that they're turning into vinegar because of course you can't drink all that wine and you don't even want to because you're just collecting it. I hate people like that, but <laughs> so sad. But this was a time where people really were trading a lot of wine back and forth. And so this was when you could say wine was a good investment. I personally do not think wine is a good investment, but at this time it was. So Rudy Kernawan is an Indonesian dude, young guy who shows up in the early 2000s, shows up in LA and and New York, just throwing money around. This guy shows up. He is throwing money around in these auctions. He is going to these crazy wine dinners. He's buying wine at restaurants for his brand new wine friends. And everybody in this wine scene, which wasn't a huge community, you know, these are all these dudes. Well, there are no women anywhere. No, there are women. I'm sure there are women around, but they, uh, they only serve uh, one purpose. Mm -hmm. And yeah. So they these guys are throwing money around they are partying they are drinking priceless wines going to crazy restaurants rudy shows up and he just slides right into this community by throwing down he's throwing down cash but also he had a photographic memory but like palate memory so he could taste a wine and then identify it blind you know two years later like he he was super knowledgeable about wine in a, in a real way. And his palate was insane. He was obsessed with Domaine Romani Conti, which we already talked about, which is this really rare, expensive cult stuff. You know, 2015 Latash, which is a, a single vineyard of Romani Conti is uh, $10,000. $10, like this is these now, you know, then they were probably a little cheaper, but these guys are all buying wine from each other too. I mean, I, I see it as insider trading in a way, but yeah, he was nicknamed Dr. Conti. So that's his nickname. He was a pretty, you know, just showed up and charmed everyone. Acro Marilyn Condit, who is run by John Capon, they, who was like his BFF, sold uh, two major lots of his, netting over $35 million. The second auction beat the records by more than $10 million. And Acker, this is interesting, because Acker like wasn't really a big player. You know, Christie's, Sotheby's, these are the big players in the auction market. Acker was not a huge player. And then, you know, John Capon is best friends with Rudy Kernawan and and they sort of go in together and all of a sudden Acker's getting all this attention. People were becoming suspicious because he's just throwing around all this like insanely, insanely old, um, rare, super valuable wine. It's hard to throw around those accusations. You know, old wine is hard to, to prove if it's fake or not. Provenance is difficult because the fact is old wine tastes weird. And 
it might be completely off. And that's just, you know, that's just it. It's nobody's fault. Like you could say, you know, if you buy, open a bottle of something from the forties, it could be completely disgusting. Um, I've never had wine that old. The oldest wine I've had is from the fifties and it was, it was good, but it had real provenance, but it was still old and weird. Like normal people probably wouldn't have liked it very much. So towards the end, you know, 2007, 2008, people are starting to get uh, suspicious. In April of 2007, there are magnums of 82 Le, Le Pen, which is um, Bordeaux, at Christie's, and they were on the cover of the catalog. And the Chateau calls Christie's and like, no, this is not it. And I'm not sure exactly what the context was of those, but the thing is, wines like that, they're not making a lot of them. They're not making a lot of these magnums. And so by 82, you would think that the Chateau would probably know where these magnums are and whether, mm-hmm. you know, whether they're still around. 2006, this one actually did slip through. But, you know, he was selling magnums of Le Fleur, uh, 1947, Le Fleur, which were, which were obviously fake because there were only five that were ever made. Oh, wow. Okay. And so this is kind of where, where, how, how hard it is to prove this. So in 2008, he tries to sell a series of bottles by Domaine Ponceau in Burgundy from um, the vineyard Clos Saint-Denis, Grand Cru Vineyard, from 1945 to 1971. But uh, Laurent Ponceau, who is the, the owner there, he's like, he's already suspicious because this guy is throwing a lot of his wine around. And again, these are tiny, tiny quantities. These wines just don't exist anymore. They've been drunk by now. You know, he finally got his proof because the domain didn't have that vineyard until 82. So he mm. fucked up. He fucked up in this little way where like the, that bit wine exists now, but it did not exist then. So he flies to New York and basically forces Acker, Maryland Condit to pull those wines from the auction. He sat through the auction to make sure that nobody saw it. He meets with Rudy because he's like, okay, this could be, this could be a mistake. Where did you get it from? And he really was, this guy was really smooth, you know, but after that, um, nobody really trusted him and, and it was harder for people to move his wines. So there, the, in this documentary, Sour Grapes, the only, the only women in this documentary are a journalist and then Maureen Downey, who is a wine fraud specialist and she has winefraud.com and it's her job. She's the wine FBI to like decide if something is real or fake. So she gets involved. And in March, 2012, the FBI go to his house with a fucking warrant and they find a whole operation. He Mm. had everything set up to, um, you know, to fake labels, corks, stamps, tools for counterfeiting. He would buy cheap Napa to like pass off his older vintages of Bordeaux. The burgundies, he would buy older, cheaper burgundies and then relabel them. He would blend like different vintages that were less prestigious in t- and then sell it as like a more prestigious vintage of like the same one. So he was really clever about it. He was eventually, um, you know, indicted on mail and wire fraud and all this other stuff and, and, uh, and put in prison, but he got out a couple of years ago. He, uh, and, and is back in Indonesia. Turns out that he was part of this whole like organized crime family. And they were like, go child, do your fun thing. Like you love wine, go for it. That's so insane. <laughs> I know. And he, but he was incredible. I mean, he was an incredible taster. So my connection to this case, it goes all the way back to 2012. So he gets arrested in March, 2012. The summer of 2012, I get a job at the World of Fine Wine magazine, which is the most prestigious magazine in the world of wine. And, you know, with really wonderful editor, Neil Beckett, who's just like gentle English, older English gentleman. And he is like, I'm really busy with the September issue. Like, I don't have time for this project. But John Capon, the auctioneer, who managed to not go down for this at all, although I have my suspicions, and they are just that, completely speculative. But he... um. He basically is like, fuck, 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 you know, PR. Oh my God. Like, what am I going to do? And, uh, he basically gave world of fine wine magazine publisher a shit ton of money to make him a book of his tasting notes. So it's basically this vanity project from John Capon of of 10 years of his, uh, his email newsletter, which was all these tasting notes. And so the editor hands me this like huge stack of papers. He's like, um, can you do something with this? And I was like, uh, okay. So I basically, wrote and I wrote all the like vignettes for it and I edited John Capon's vanity project and it was oh my god it was disgusting honestly these assholes were drinking priceless wine at three in the morning when they were shit-faced they were they were all buying wine from each other there are no women anywhere and they describe well they're, they're I'm sure there are women right they're all coked up they um the way he describes wine is so pornographic it's so degrading to women it's so gross like there's so much like sexualizing of the wine in the tasting notes it's just like dirty and gross so that was really traumatizing, honestly, like reading through these 10 years of fucking email, email uh, newsletters. I mean, the whole thing was so self-indulgent. I, I j- dislike the fine wine market because of the, having to do this project and having to be like, 
in this. Oh, and I had to remove Rudy, Rudy from the record. I mean, he's everywhere. Dr. Conti, Dr. Pino, all over. I mean, they were best friends. So I think it's unlikely that he did not know what was going on, but um, he's going to fucking sue me. <laughs> Hopefully he never hears this. Uh, yeah, they got, they got uh, a slap on the wrist for trying to sell some fake uh, Patty Van, um, Patty Van Winkle. What's the fucking whiskey? Oh, um, Pappy Van Winkle. Pappy Van close. Winkle. Yeah. But um, somehow they kind of rebranded a little bit, but I don't think he ever really fully recovered from it. But he never went down with the ship, though. He never went to jail, uh, John Capon. So I guess they couldn't prove that he knew. And maybe he didn't. Maybe he really didn't. Please don't sue me. But I think you're disgusting after reading 10 years of your pornographic tasting notes. So that's my connection. (laughs) That's wild. Now, I know you love my fellow host, Emily Monaco. So make sure to head to Navigating the French, Emily's other podcast, where she dives deep into French culture, Frenchisms, language, all kinds of crazy stuff. Super, super fun. And you can find it on Paris Underground Radio. And we will be right back with a word from our sponsors. And now back to the Terroir Podcast. And that whole world of like crazy expensive fine wine is super wild. And I think obviously like synonymous to a certain extent with Burgundy, but we also have like, you know, remember that this is also like, it's, there's farming, there's, it's like a rural area and there are a lot of like high flyers blowing money, but there's also a lot of sort of down home traditional wine and to a a more extent food. So the the food here, I mean, we're going to talk a lot about this next week as well, but we do have, you know, one really important sort of phrase that's going to pertain to some of the food here, which is à la bourguignon, which means in the style of Burgundy. We've talked about this on previous podcast, uh, on previous episodes. And à la bourguignon can actually refer to two different flavor profiles that we find typically in Burgundy. But today we're just going to talk about one of them because I think it's the one that's most pertinent to what we've been talking about so far, which is, of course, the wine. Because oh, à la bourguignon can mean in a red wine sauce. And typically in a red wine sauce with mushrooms. And obviously, as you said, this is Pinot Noir. So typically in a Pinot Noir sauce. No one is cooking with Pinot Noir, though. I'll tell you that much. Nobody. That's true. It's too expensive. (laughs) It's too expensive. And yet that's what people always call for in. So I think that I think this is where we kind of need to break open the perception of French cooking in America versus what's actually happening on the ground in France, because people get their mind, I think, you know, Julia Child had something to do with it, but like this idea of like holding French food on a pedestal, like there is obviously like very expensive, we were just talking about Bocuse, there is very expensive, very fancy French food, but there's Mm -hmm. also the food of the people. And I think whereas like the Cucina Povera of Italy, like people understand that that's just like make stuff with what you have. I feel like a lot of the time, the recipes that grew up as like peasant food, things like Coco Vin, which is literally like, what am I going to do with my like scrawny old rooster that's too tough to roast? I'm going to stew it in a lot of leftover wine. Like it's it's really just ways of using up things that you don't want to throw away. And so when we see à la Bourguignon in Burgundy, we're looking at things like Coco Vin. We're looking at things like Matelot d'Anguille, which is eel stew, stewed in red wine. And it's not necessarily, you know, you're not stewing stuff in your fancy in your fancy burgundy or you're, you're stewing stuff maybe in your wine that's like turned a little bit or that like you just happen to have on hand you know this might have been these might have been recipes that were invented you know pre phylloxera when you still maybe had a parcel that you could plant and make your own wine in you know i'm not i mean i don't have the exact you know origin of these of these dishes except for one which is the most famous which is beef bourguignon buffet bourguignon I do love Beef Bourguignon. And who doesn't, right? It's delicious. It's rich. It's, you know, flavorful. It's beefy. But for as much as we love this recipe and we love Julia Child for popularizing it for Americans, it might not actually originate in Burgundy. (gasps) Yes. I know. It's crazy. So there's a couple different stories kind of surfacing as to how this came to be. And obviously when it is a true like Cucina Povera or 
cuisine de la pauvre, pauvre dish, like a rural dish, we don't have an origin story because people are probably making it and being like, oh, I stewed my beef in wine. Try this. And, you know, everybody's making it and we don't really know who started it. We do know that the first written re written reference to it, it's not even a recipe, but it's a reference to within the style of a la bourguignon, beef being stewed a la bourguignon, dates to the 19th century. So it's something that people were probably making without a recipe. And the name comes from the use of Burgundy wine rather than the fact that people are making it in Burgundy, which is odd because Burgundy wine is probably not something that you want to cook with. So it's, it's a little bit flu. It's a little bit blurry. But we do kind of have this idea that as of the mid-19th century, it's more a dish of the poor and more something you would do with leftovers. So you have like a beef roast and you have some leftover wine and you kind of stew them together and you can eat it again. So it's not something people want to admit that they're eating, especially not somewhere as fancy as Burgundy. So it really only starts being seen as a Burgundian specialty in the 20th century. And that's when we start to see the appeal of some of these like rural rustic dishes as opposed to the fancy highfalutin Parisian food that everybody else wants to be perceived as being as eating. And so the idea of beef bourguignon as being like a classic Burgundian Sunday meal really only rises in the 20th century. Oh, interesting. Yeah. So I actually, for my other podcast on Paris under, Underground Radio, um, Navigating the French, I actually interviewed Emmanuel Rubin, who is one of the foremost culinary journalists in France. And he was talking about the word en dimanche, which is where you set your table for the Sunday lunch. But it's this idea of having like a fancy Sunday. Ugh, that's all I want. Who have, my a future husband, Sunday? if you're listening, all I want is to make you a fancy Sunday lunch. I mean, who doesn't want a fancy Sunday lunch? And he was talking about how because he grew up with Bur a Burgundian mother, he often would have beef bourguignon as his Sunday lunch. And the appetizer would be something called oeuf en moret, which typically, I mean, you're, you're the chef here, so correct me if I'm wrong, but it's usually the wine sauce from beef bourguignon that's used to then poach eggs in it, right? Yeah, it's like a red wine sauce with onions. It's nice. It's like a little, yeah. it's like, it's like a baked egg. Yeah. In the sauce. In a red wine like, sauce. Yeah, it's like an egg in the red wine sauce. It's nice. Yeah. yeah. No, it's nice. So that's kind of a typical, these days, a typical Burgundian Sunday lunch is like, you know, something that has quite a bit of red wine sauce in it. And so a la bourguignon. But this existence of beef bourguignon is obviously, you know, a fairly modern, almost retconned terroir to Burgundy. But it does rely on another local specialty, which is Charolais beef. Ooh, yeah. Yeah. So it's some of the best beef in France. It comes from Southern Burgundy. These are white cows, which are known for really good marbling, really tender beef, which, I mean, if you come from the US and you taste French beef, you're often going to find it quite chewy because all of our cows are grass fed. So there's no grain feeding or grain finishing. And so you don't have that kind of melt in your mouth tenderness usually that you would get with American beef. Um, but these do have tender beef. And if you look at the bowls, I'll, we'll put a, a photo in the show notes because they are jacked. Like these are some crazy muscly beef. And so it's really tasty, really prized in France. It's the second most numerous cow breed in France after the Holstein with, you know, over 4 million total heads of uh, Charolais beef. And these days it is also protected by an AOC. So, you know, that label that we talk about all the time on the Terror War podcast. If you don't know what an AOC is yet, what are you even still doing here? Where have you been? What are you, do what are you doing? Been? Go okay, back. Let's just... Listen to the other ones. AOC is an AOC? when we protect a thing and put a place name on it and say it has to be this, this, but this and this, and then it has to be like that. Yeah, that's exactly what it is. It has to be this, this and that, and it has to be like this. And in this case... But then it gets to say the name. It gets to be labeled as the thing. Exactly. So in this case, we're talking about Boeuf de Charol, so the region that gives the Charolais beef its name. Um, and so this beef is used in a lot of ways, not just in beef bourguignon, which, as I mentioned, is really at its heart, at its origin, just a way of using up scraps. That also has a little bit to do with the fact that in France, we butcher cattle differently. So in the U.S., we tend to butcher cows to have as little waste as possible, which means that you end up with steaks that have two different textures on the same piece or that have like one piece, one side that's fatter and the other side that's thinner. Whereas the French butchering tradition wants each cut to be only one muscle and to have only one thickness, which means that you do have more waste, but we don't actually just throw it away. It's not waste, like get rid of it. It's waste like, okay, now it's stew meat. So we need mm -hmm. 
to figure out ways to stew it and stewing it in red wine is delicious. But another way that you can use up sort of scraps from the French butchering process is in another dish that has bourguignon in the name, which is fondue bourguignon. Yet another misnomer because fondue bourguignon is not Burgundian. It is Swiss. We're not talking about Switzerland on this podcast. We are not. So fondue à la bourguignon. Fuck Switzerland. Switzerland's boring. Switzerland has clocks and chocolate and cheese. What are you talking about? I don't know why I hate Switzerland. I think it's because it's very close to here. And so I feel competitive with it. I have no, I have no reason (laughs) for the, for whatever I feel about Switzerland, which is, is literally, I have not been there in years besides to go to the airport, which sucks. Geneva airport sucks. That's true. That is true. Fondue bourguignon doesn't suck, although I have to say, you know, as a cheese head, I much prefer fondue savoyard, which is the (laughs) cheese kind. But fondue bourguignon gets its name from Burgundy, but it was invented in 1948 in Lausanne by a cafe owner who noticed that his friends from Bohemia were cooking meat in boiling oil. He was like, that's a cool interactive way to eat meat and not at all dangerous. So he (laughs) starts serving um, his guests pots of boiling oil or broth and, you know, bits of Charolais beef, which you cook in the oil or in the broth, and then you dip in a variety of sauces. And because they use Charolais beef and because they pair it with uh, Burgundy wine, they start calling it fondue bourguignon. So perfect. Not, not Burgundian cuisine. For more about actual Burgundian cuisine, you're going to have to tune in next week. That is Interesting because I am hungry again, even though I ate so much fucking food last night. (laughs) That's how it works, isn't it? Uh, I guess so. Well, thank you, Emily, for talking to us a little bit about some of those dishes. Um, I know it was was a big one. Well, and thank you for taking me through the the Russian dolls (laughs) that are Burgundian wines. I think people are probably going to have a bit more information and ideas about, about, you know, what Burgundy is. But if you want to learn more about Burgundy in specific and wine in general, you should definitely visit Caroline in Lyon and go on one of her wine tastings or even take her wine trip. She's uh, bringing people to Lyon, teaching them all about local wine and uh, guiding them through, you know, how to how to taste and, and taking you just taking people to some really awesome Michelin starred spots. Is that right? That's right. Le wine Dine Leon is going to be really fun. That's in October. And we're going to do, um, well, we're going to go to a Michelin star, two star restaurant. We're going to visit a bunch of wineries. We're going to do cooking classes. It's going to be a, it's going to be a whole thing. It's going to be awesome. That's in October, but I'm going to do more after that. So uh, who knows? Maybe I'll, we'll go to your favorite region at some point, but yeah, this has, uh, this has been the terroir podcast. Thank you, Emily, Emily underscore in underscore France on Instagram. Yeah. And thank you, Caroline wine, dine Caroline on Instagram. Yeah, and we really hope to see you guys in France. Come visit us. We're here. Come visit us. uh, And in the meantime, please feel free to uh, subscribe to the podcast, like the podcast on Apple Podcasts, and, you know, keep on listening and get in touch. If you uh, want to know more about a specific region, if there's a region that's of particular interest to you, let us know. Reach out on Twitter um, or on on Instagram. Don't reach out on Twitter. That's It's broken and now owned by Elon Musk. Oh, God. Why? Reach out on Instagram. Let us know, and we like Instagram to is better you. owned by better people. Jesus, right? Um, Every, <laughs> no. Instagram is Instagram is owned by not awful billionaires. Just no, send us a letter to send me a letter to Caroline uh, address Leon France. Hire a pigeon. Send yeah. it to me. Carrier um, pigeon. in Paris, a carrier pigeon, an African swallow. Just just stand somewhere and yell really loudly. Hopefully, Emily. We'll hear you. <laughs> and um, yeah. That's it. Thank you for listening. We love you guys. Thank you for listening. Bon appétit. Bon appétit. This episode of was produced by Jennifer Garrity. For more on this show and shows like it, please visit parisundergroundradio.com.